today. That's good. Hey, here we are. Uh, we're rolling on with this P200 restoration. You'll notice it's no longer upside down. That's because we've done with all the upside down work. We've got it flipped right side up. Uh, we're basically getting ready to put the engine in. That's going to be the next step. Again, constantly stressing the order of operations and how critical that is. Um, now is the time to put the motor in. Uh, you'll kind of see the way we've got the frame prepped. Uh, this is a good way for any uh, do-it-yourself kind of at-home restoration mechanic guy. Uh, we've got the center stand on two 2x4 two blocks on each side. And at the back of the bike, you notice we've got a generic automotive jack stand. We've actually pulled the frame up a little bit. So it's a little bit higher. Um, it's probably about three, and a, three to four inches higher than it would normally be if we were just sitting on the ground with the tire installed and everything. Uh, we've got our large bolt that goes through the uh, frame and through the swing arm of the motor. We've also got uh, the special bolt, the uh, 014689, that special nine millimeter bolt that holds the rear shock on. We'll apply a thin layer of grease to each one of these bolts just to kind of help them pass through. Also keep them from getting rusty and nasty over, uh, over uh, time as the bike kind of racks up some miles. The final thing I can kind of think I can say about the motor is you see we've got a new-ish. I guess we've got a cleaned up original shock <laughs> back there. Well, hey, it was still good. If it's still good, why bother replacing it? We did replace that little special triangular rubber buffer that's up there. Uh, well, I guess not triangle. It's more of a rectangle. I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyhow, so that's installed. And then, of course, you always want to make sure that you properly tighten the shock to that buffer. So you've got this back here ready to install. And if this is at the wrong angle, it's not that big a deal. The shock will actually rotate. And you'll see once we put the motor up there, uh, we'll rotate it a little bit. I can't think of any too much else to say about the frame. Uh, Robot's going to talk about you know, the engine rebuild he did real quickly, but more importantly, what he's done uh, to get the motor ready to install in the frame. So Robot, take it away. All right, so we got the motor all rebuilt. Basically, it's this is the motor, everybody. Oh yeah, this the motor it. right here. Uh, it's actually got new engine cases because the, in the engine cases that were original to this bike, they wouldn't hold the main seal and had some other issues. So it started with a new set of PX engine cases. See, they're slightly different. It's got the electric start boss, and we just actually um, filled it with a little block off plate. Uh, I mean, look at it, watch our other video for tips on rebuilding. P200, P125, any of these rotary valve uh, large frame Vespa motors, they're all pretty much the same. A um, couple things, a lot of people I see they'll assemble the whole motor, they'll put the air box on, the selector box on, flywheel, don't need to do that. You want to keep the motor a little bit lighter so I left the flywheel off. Um, selector box is off because when we're going to go ahead and string the shift cables through, it's a lot easier to actually hook them up to the selector box when it's hanging you know, off the engine. You can get them adjusted real nice before you actually bolt it to the engine. We'll get to that one. It's yeah, no big deal. And same time with for cable, installing the cables. And no big deal putting the flywheel and stator and setting the timing with it in the bike. It's actually kind of right there at the right, right height. Uh, one thing is if the air box is in the way, it's actually quite difficult to lift the motor into the frame because it actually hangs up right on this point. So it's best to leave that off and you can see I've actually blocked off the, um, the intake. I have the newer style PX um, a clamp down bolts and the larger gasket that comes in the gasket kit. These are unique to the later PXs but they work a little easier than the older style uh, studs with the, um, the hollow kind of nuts that they use on the older bikes. Uh, other than that we're going to go ahead and pop that motor and clean out the holes on the frame so the bolt passes through no problem. And it should be a breeze lifting the motor right in. Slide the axle bolt right through or the pivot bolt. Kind of got to hold the uh, kickstarter down a little bit. Bolt goes in from, from right to left. Yeah, um, both bolts go in this way. So we're going to go ahead and cut, reposition everything, and then uh, come back to us putting this bad boy in this bad boy. All right, so we're actually ready to put the motor in the frame. We're going to do this real time. Let's see how smoothly it does or doesn't go. What I like to do is kind of lift it up here. And you notice you'll kind of hold it at a bit of an exaggerated angle. Robot's going to be on the back side and he's going to help line it up. There you go. So he's got a large screwdriver through on that side. And it's really easy for me to A lot of times, too, it's a little easier if you do this without the kickstart lever in the way. But you can see I've just pushed the kickstart lever down in order to get the bolt started. Bolt will pretty go in pretty effortlessly. Robot's going to get it aligned on the other side. And then it just pushes the rest of the way in. 
Robot's gonna take our new lock washer and nut and get that loosely threaded on there so that nut won't back out or anything. Um, Go ahead and lift the, the rear of the engine. Without the air box, it's actually going to easily clear. Sometimes with new shocks and new bushings, you sometimes need to actually spread the, um, the actual tongues of the uh, lower shock mount out. But this one was fine. No big deal. And again, make sure that this bolt goes through this way. I've actually seen motors come in the shop where this bolt goes through that way because someone put this on with the back tire and backing plate off. Uh, don't want to do that. <laughs> so robot, we got everything aligned. So robot's going to pull that out. And as he pulls that out, I'm going to just push that bolt in. And that's pretty much it. He'll thread that on there. And then of course, we're going to go ahead and torque both of those. Um, and then we'll uh, catch back up on the next step. So basically, I'm reusing the Cedo Plus. One thing about these Cedo Plus pipes, they're kind of big. So they actually hit the uh, shock spring when the, the shock is all the way down. So the easiest way to do it is I'll have Steve actually pull the shock bolt out and lift the motor a little bit. And this, this bolt actually will thread right through, no problem. But with the motor lifted a little bit, it, you know, it works a lot easier for getting the, um, the shock bolt right through to the actual square nut or you know, the trap nut that they have back in that thing. So you know, once you get it started, there you go, started. Now you can put the shock bolt back in and re retorque that. And so now that you've it's, got that side started, it's still here, loose here. Why don't you come out and walk on this way? Best thing to do is again with that side loose. Whoo! We got to move this one over pretty good. You can actually kind of grab this portion of the header. Robot's going to make sure the bike doesn't move. Watch out that the rear doesn't. There we go. All right, can I get it about like, oops, I just cussed. Sorry about that, Mom. And you can kind of just take some sort of a dead blow hammer or rubber mallet and just tap that thing all the way on. And you can hear that little ping. Basically means it's fully seated and you want to go ahead and tighten that 13 millimeter or 8 millimeter stud with a 13 millimeter wrench. While I'm doing that, robot's going to tighten the back thing of the exhaust. The jaw kind of pans up. You'll see that we've already got uh, the carburetor kind of hooked up. Not sure if you can see in here, John. You always, when you're working on this stuff, want to pay attention to not let stuff fall down the carburetor, hence the safety rag there. You'll also notice that uh, we've already got our fuel line laced through there. Again, with the fuel line, for in my opinion, it's easiest to pass it down through that grommet in the air box, through the special grommet in the frame there. And you want to just use any sort of WD-40, any, anything to basically make it so it passes through those grommets nice and easy. And we're going to leave it kind of loose up in the tank here. Um, and this is actually a little excessively long, but the next thing when we go to install the tank, we'll install that and then we'll pull the slack of the fuel line back out. When you put the carburetors in, you always want to make sure that that, uh, you know, the throttle connecting linkage is dropped in place. So you want to drop that as you put the carburetor in. And then we've got our two fasteners secured for the carburetor. Uh, that's about all we've done. Up on the top there, I think the uh, robot's ready to be putting the uh, rear drum and uh, back tire on. So John will go ahead and mosey on that way. We'll get the tire on, and then we'll uh, cut to the next thing. All right, so back plate's on, all the uh, O-rings. There's like a total of four O-rings back behind the plate. I got my tail light wire. I'm not going to worry about that right now. Uh, brake shoes are on, just like the same same way I built the front, exact same brake shoes. Uh, so it's all set up. The uh, 61 Omega clips are in place. Got my thick washer and my 2314 nut right there. Hub's all cleaned up, ready to go. And basically a little bit of grease on there and you're able to slip the tire up in there. And Steve, we'll have to pull this jack back just a little bit. Yeah, with these speed 200s, this cutout on the, uh, the back of the frame is actually there, so you can get the uh, wheel in easier. And there we go. Put the washer in. Nut. And right now, I'm not going to bother tightening that. But once I have the tire down on the uh, table, I'll be able to torque this. 
around, around 80 foot-pounds, but it's pretty much give or take where you line up one of the slots so you can put the cotter pin through. And I'll do that a little bit later, pop the little cap on there. Oh, hey guys, check this out. This is the fork right here. It's got some magical parts on it since I built the fork two days ago. Got the fender on here. Uh, I want to talk about how I put the fender on. Basically, you put the fender on before I put these, uh, the bearing race and the lower grease cup on there. Uh, the, the hole on this fender is kind of a rounded rectangle. It actually drops over these steering stops. You kind of got to manipulate it right over those steering stops. Then the fender bolts with, with uh, three M6 bolts. There's washers, uh, lock washers, the whole sort under there. Um, on the side there, you can see I put a chrome fastener. Could be a M5, M6. Put a nylock nut on the back side. And Steve's going to take over talking about the, the, the fork bearings themselves and the steering stops here. So like Robot said, the fender goes on first. Now it's actually would be time to install this lower grease cup. The partner bar on that grease cup is a 019264. And then you're going to install the lower race. I don't recall the part number on the of the lower race off the top of my hand, but these dust cups you pretty much always have to buy because in order to get the fen old fender off, you pretty much have to destroy these drifting the race up. Uh, as far as the steering bearings and races go, um, part number 152023, uh, 152024 are all part numbers for complete steering, steering bearing sets. And the complete sets you're going to get uh, both of the races for the lower, both the races for the upper, and then the bearing for the lower and the bearing for the upper. Um, in order to install that grease cup, the grease cup commonly just kind of drops down, but there is an interference fit between the lower race and the actual cast aluminum knuckle that is that, uh, that's built into the steering stop there. Uh, we've got a little homemade tool. Uh, where did this come from, robot? Oh, oh yeah, I took apart my mom's hammock. <laughs> this that's happened literally, to be the perfect size. So. That's literally what it is. And we're talking inside diameter on this is about an inch and three eighths. Uh, we've kind of cut it to the rough length and then just welded a plate on the back side of it. Not necessary to weld the plate on the back side, but that's kind of nice. As long as it's tall enough and runs wild, then you can actually take a good size hammer and actually drive this down and hammer that race on. So normally you do this without these cables in there. This would slide down, it would seat on the race, and you would just tap it down until the race bottoms out. You'll notice in this lower grease cup, we've actually kind of jumped the gun and packed it with uh, uh, the official preferred shop grease of the shop, uh, the stuff we sell on our website. Uh, I believe the part number on this is grease, free trip part number. Mm -hmm. uh, but this stuff really is awesome. Um, so we basically just want to pack that with liberally with grease and you want to take the bearing and do the same thing, kind of, you know, just like packing any bearing, don't really need to go over that in great, too much detail. Uh, put enough of that on there. What we're going to do is we're going to drop this down and then we're going to set the fork off to the side and we're going to show you uh, prepping the frame. And robot's gonna kind of hold it. I'm gonna be as careful as I can so as we don't get grease all over everything. Not that it really matters. Just slide that down and watch the blue goo explosion. Kind of seat it down in there and you can kind of pack some of that excess grease in there. Um, and these, these steering bearings are gonna last forever. All right, so that's it. That's the fork ready to be installed. Let's check in on uh, the status of the frame. Okay, so before we actually install the frame in the fork, strike that, reverse it. Before we install the fork in the frame, I guess I could go either way, depending on how you really want to look at it. This is the question. Um, there's a couple of things we want to point out on the frame. Uh, you'll notice there's the lower race. Uh, we showed it in an earlier step when the bike was upside down, kind of cleaning all the paint and stuff off of it. Commonly, it's no point removing that race. That was the case with this one. The race was still in good shape, so voila, it stays in there. One thing we'll notice, and I believe we mentioned this earlier too, is you'll see how there's some markings on both sides of this. And this thing kind of comes in at a nice angle and then goes up. These are essentially the steering stops. What happens very commonly on the vintage Vespas is the steering stops get worn out because the handlebars get over rotated. And the telltale sign will be the denting at the top of the leg shield. Uh, of all the things on the vintage Vespas that drive me crazy, uh, that's probably it. The fact that the steering stops get worked and people just let the handlebars whack the leg shield. On the P-Series bikes are the easiest to repair uh, because the horn cover is removable. But what you do is you take a big old flat chisel and a good sized hammer and you would just kind of hold that in there and you basically just kind of beat that back into shape. Uh, we like to do that before we actually paint so you know everything gets covered in paint but you know it's better to do that 
after paint as opposed to having steering stops that are worn out. On the 60s and 70s bikes, the horn cover is not removable, but it's common that you'll still have to do this repair. Uh, the best way to do it is actually kind of drill clean holes through the legs, through the horn cover, and go in there with a punch and actually just fix them and then weld up the holes. Also, too, Robot will show one final thing. He talked about the steering knuckle. This cast aluminum steering knuckle actually contacts the steering stops on each side. So as this, as this fender rotates, those knuckles contact those two stops, and that's essentially what limits, you know, the handlebar travel. Um, yeah, if they're too blown out, usually I'll go in there before it's powder coated with a TIG welder, build up the, these corners here. And usually you add a, a heck of a lot more than you need, and then you can go back in there and dry fit it and grind out what you don't need. So uh, robot's, robot's going to set the fender down. We're going to talk quickly about the uh, order of uh, upper bearings, and then we'll, I promise, be putting the fork in the frame. Okay, so the uh, lower race of the upper bearing assembly has been installed. Pretty simple, easy to install. We showed that earlier on. You basically just at this point want to, uh, and that's that race there, the kind of steel looking thing. Um, the blue grease, you just kind of want to pack that liberally with some grease. Um, and that's pretty much it. Obviously you want to inspect these races, make sure there's no rusting, pitting, galling, anything like that. These look in good shape, so we're able to hit them with the uh, wire wheel and they're all reusable. Uh, so that's installed. Uh, robot's going to talk really quickly about the uh, upper steering bearing and the way that thing goes as far as top and bottom because a lot of people get confused and lost on that step. All right, so this is the actual uh, upper bearing race that actually threads down onto the fork. Uh, it's in good shape, kind of wire wheeled it. Uh, this is a brand new upper cage bearing here. Uh, one thing about this cage bearing is it's actually got two sides. You can see the side that actually has the, the open, open ends where the, like the little ears are actually stamped over. That end actually goes up against the top race and that's the way this actually goes on top of the fork. So this bearing drops down, you have like the kind of open end, folded in, and then this threads down. Uh, you can see they got four different, four little pegs on this actual race right here. You could thread it on by hand to, you know, to snug it up at first. Then we sell this tool, which is uh, Tool SN, and it's actually the fork bearing tool. This works on pretty much all the Vespas, N new ones, old ones, all of them. Uh, pretty much lines up with these slots right here, and then you could actually torque the bearing. And when we, when we install the fork, I'll show you how much preload you'll actually want to put on this bearing. And after you get the preload set, you drop this uh, washer down that has a tab that's kind of just a, a locking washer that you know, keep, keeps this from backing up. And then there's the actual uh, ring nut that tightens down on that that keeps the whole stack. Sounds good. Let's get the fork installed and keep on rolling. All right, so here it is. We're going to put the fork in the uh, frame. Uh, the best way, in my opinion, is you can use your left hand to hold the knuckle there. Your right hand kind of guides it. And the best way to do it if you're right-handed and doing it by yourself is to stand in my position. So we are going to just kind of guide that up that lower race. Once it's fully seated, normally I could just reach around with my offhand. We've already got the upper bearing in there, but since Robot and I are tag teaming this bad boy, uh, he's starting to thread that on there. So he, I'm just kind of holding it for him. Again, so he's got two free hands to actually properly tighten both those nuts. And that's about as tight as I'm going to get by hand here. And what, what you want to do with this tool here is basically Again, the partner brought that tool go. is Tool SN, available mm -hmm. on the Scooter West website. It's actually, Steve's going to hold it right now. I'm going to actually tighten it really tight. And that's just to seat those bearing seats, you know, the, the actual races. And then Steve will actually sweep the uh, fork left side, right side. And it's perfectly hitting the uh, steering stops, no issues here. Feels nice and, nice and stiff. A lot of times, too, you'll want to make sure you can reach down. Let John come around and grab this lower knuckle with your left hand. And you almost want to spend the time to like just 
make sure that this thing doesn't jiggle around in the frame. If it jiggles around in the frame, you got issues. So I'll take my right hand here, holding the frame solid, and left hand on the steering knuckle. And if there's any amount of play in that thing at all whatsoever, you need to fix that now before you go on to the next step. Uh, because we got robot doing this, everything is super tight and just awesome. So that's how you double check that. So, you know, now that the bearing is seated, you could actually, since our stops are good, I could, you could just leave it up against that uh, left hand stop. I'm going to actually break this free. And about all the pressure you want, it's just like kind of like one finger is all you want. It's just, you know, if you're going to put a torque wrench on it, it's only like three or four foot pounds. It doesn't take much at all. It's just enough to just barely, you know, basically make contact with those bearings. And then Steve will kind of check the free play. Feels perfect. Just like super smooth. No Real notchiness. Real easy to turn. You know, obviously when I crank, cranked it down, it bound a little bit. But that, we just did that to seat the, um, the bearing seats. That, that was the only reason. I know that the general kind of rules, you can kind of hold the fork kind of straight forward and it should just kind of fall nice and smoothly to either side. The robot's got it right. I drop this washer on, you can see the little tab on it. it actually drops right on to that little slot. Then we'll thread this last, uh, the, the locking nut. And you see these are the original nuts, they're in really good shape. A lot of people take chisels to these so they're all beat up. If they look pretty bad, it would be a good idea just to change them out this time. And commonly the complete set, the 152023, is actually going to come with everything you see there. I'm just going to kind of hold the cables out of the way for a robot for the sake of the camera. And th this one right here, you actually want to give it a pretty good snug. And, you know, you don't need to really go to town on it, but it needs to be snug. You know, if you were on it with a torque wrench, I don't know, be like, 15 to 20 foot pounds, somewhere in that range. And this still feels really smooth, no binding whatsoever. But essentially those two nuts at this point are kind of sandwiched on top of each other. Um, and as long as you do that correctly, those, these nuts will never work their way loose. So the steering bearings in theory should always stay within adjustment nice and tight. So that's pretty much it on the steering bearings. I can't think of too much else, robot. Um, that's it, we could actually take our blocks out, drop the front end down. At this point, we've got a roller. Probably what we'll do though, um, is we'll drop the handlebars on next, um, and then we'll get the thing off the bench, and then we'll kind of work on uh, hooking stuff up. All right, so you see the bike's now on the ground. We've got our temporary handlebars set up. Uh, this is a pretty slick little trick, not really rocket science or anything, it's just vice grips. Uh, so for the sake of moving this thing around, we've just clamped some vice grips on the fork tube, but it makes it so you can actually take this thing off the stand, wheel it around, and move it around in the shop. Uh, so cool little trick. Uh, we're just about ready to drop the handlebars on, so I'm going to go ahead and remove this, and then uh, we'll show you a couple tips as far as getting the handlebars seated correctly and efficiently. Okay, so we're ready to drop our handlebars on, and earlier on in the video we showed the proper way to prep these to make sure there's no paint on any of these uh, interference surfaces, uh, so we're basically ready to drop it on. Uh, this is nice to actually have a separate set of hands. I'm just basically going to hold the handlebars while robot's going to fish stuff through. And when you do this, you always want to start with the thickest stuff first, hence robot kind of pushing the wiring through one at a time. And you can kind of push it through in a couple different spots and then wiggle it to the correct side uh, before you fully seat everything. So he's gonna, we're just going to kind of get the wiring passed through. Um, kind of jiggling it as he goes, feeding the wires through kind of one at a time, making it as easy as possible. Robot's got these amazingly long fingers that just work magic in these instances. They're well greased out right now. <laughs> Not sure why. It probably doesn't really help the situation, but it's working. All right. You can kind of see where I'm putting the wires. They actually kind of go beside that bolt thing when we're all done. Uh, then the, uh, oop. my face is probably in the camera's way. There's the throttle cable. Actually, it's going to pop through this hole a little later. Here's our clutch cable. And, you know, actually I think it goes yeah. on that side. And then there's our two shift cables. And go ahead and pull these also up just in front of the actual clutch cable. And you can see the, the ones coming through the center of the fork are kind of pulled down so they're kind of out of the way. Steve can start working this down 
Does that stay on that side of the knuckle? No, it needs to go on this side, like in front of the um. So we're gonna pull that down, because the wiring, you want the wiring to be on my side of this through bolt. So you can kind of pull it down so there's a little thin spot. Yeah, it still gets a little, little bound up, especially there's a little bit of tape where the, um, the, uh, the actual uh, front brake switch wiring is. Okay, there we go. Now it's kind of pulled through for the most part. And there we go. And Steve can start pulling this down. And our, Steve's actually holding the fender with his uh, legs. Kind of straddling it. And again, as long as everything's nice and clean, this should go down pretty easily. We're kind of fighting it a little bit, but it's actually starting to go. So you kind of rock that back and forth. You can tap it ever so slightly, wiggle it back and forth. If you're really struggling with it and everything's still clean, you can actually put a big uh, chisel in there. Just give it a couple little types, taps just enough to open up ever so slightly. So we've got these little plastic chingaderas. These are actually the cable seats. Uh, this is the opportune time to start threading the cables in the right spot before you actually thread the wires down for the handlebar switches. You'll notice there's two different styles of these. These two are the same. That's for the lower of the two selector cables and the throttle side. This special one is the upper one. And these basically fit on the P's very nicely in specific bores on the engines. I'm gonna, that's the easiest one. The best way to do these is you can actually, leaving the inner cable in, you can actually pass this thing through the correct passageways in both sides of the handlebar. You can actually use this as a bit of a guide to pull that seat in place. And the more slack you have, kind of the easier it is to work with this cable. So you want to pass that through first, and now you actually you notice these things have a little slot in it. So we can actually pass that slot around the cable, and then we'll use the housing to actually pull this thing all the way in. So I've gone ahead and done that. And now what I'll do is I'll kind of this is a little trick I like to use. You can kind of come down here to the motor and you can kind of pull the slack out of that housing and we can see which one of the two cables it is. And again, we don't really care about the upshift and downshift yet because we can adjust that down on the handlebars. And I'll take actually a pair of vice grips so I can do this kind of hands-free. You just kind of pinch that on the actual inner wire at the base of the housing. So now when we pull that inner wire, we're actually going to be pulling that whole housing up and essentially we're gonna be seating, we're gonna be seating this housing up here by doing that. So you can kind of pull that in and you can kind of feel it click into place. Robot kind of helped out with a pair of needle nose, but that's a nice little trick. And then we'll do the same thing with the other selector cable and then the throttle cable. And we'll just kind of leave that for the time being. All right, so I went ahead and installed the right hand switch. It's kind of a little bit thicker than your left hand switch, so this is a harder one to install. Uh, basically, I tied a piece of guide wire to it, just kind of wrapped it around all the terminals. You can kind of see I wrapped it all up with tape, made like a bullet, so it'll pass through easy. Uh, it basically goes between the throttle cable and the main harness right here. It's pretty, pretty tight on this right-hand side, but that's where it goes. Uh, you poke this wire through, and Steve's got it on the right-hand side of the fork. You know, it's going to tie to these junction wires eventually. Basically, he's going to go ahead and pull the wire. It definitely kind of helps, like you'll notice that when you try and do this, as you kind of rotate the handlebars back and forth, that will kind of help the thing pull through. And then some type of, any type of lubricant, it doesn't matter what it is, it could be even uh, disc soap, whatever, you know, just something to help kind of lubricate the, the sheathing. And I'm going to let Robot push and I'm just going to kind of pull. So it's more pushing than pulling. We'll see if we so get Sometimes it. you want to, you know, turn the steering if it, if it needs just a little bit or if it's binding up a little bit. There you go, he just gave birth to a wire down there. Look at that beauty. And you can unwrap the tape on it. And do and that you can look bit. how clean this passes through in just the right spot. You know, it's almost like it passes through that little notch in the handlebars. All right, we're pretty much at the point where we can actually install the throttle tube as well as the shift tube. This is the throttle tube. Uh, hopefully John can see this pretty well, but there's actually this uh, pressed on like stop washer and this washer actually contacts the handlebars and keeps this thing from going too far and or from uh, rotating nice and smoothly. I don't know why it is, but every time you take one of these P200s apart, probably just from years of abuse, this washer 
is completely wavy and hammered and stuff. So I took this thing over the bench press and actually kind of hammered that as smooth as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you, you know, now's the time to fix that. On this end, this is the end that actually fits inside the handlebars. We've actually taken this to our wire wheel and completely wire wheel on our bench grinder and completely dressed that. So this thing just slides in effortlessly. That's how it should be. This is gonna have, this bike is gonna have one smooth throttle. And you'll notice there how that thrust washer is nice and flat against the handlebars. That's what you want. But before we actually install this final, uh, we're gonna put the grip on. Uh, we always use a little bit of grip glue. We sell single shot things of grip glue that are very handy. One thing I wanted to show you on the throttle side is our same stop basically has that like elevated edge. When you go to slide this grip on, that, this grip always gets hung up really bad on that. So what I like to do this is the little tip and thing that I do is I take my box cutter with a nice sharp blade and I'll just kind of just very carefully cut, just kind of accentuate the beveled edge there. So when we go to slide this thing on, it's really easy. And the other thing too is a lot of these old Ves vintage Vespa grips have a, a Piaggio logo of some kind. So these are the original grips for a P-Series bike. I believe the part number on these is a 141-923. Again, the part number, I believe, is a 141-923, and there's different versions of them. But because there's these notches in the throttle tube, uh, where essentially the uh, front brake passes through, because keep in mind, you know, you're going to be reaching for your front brake there. So these two little pass-throughs are for the actual cable, the front brake cable housing. You want to actually slide this thing in and pay attention to where it's going to go. So before you glue this grip, in place, the Piaggio logo is in the right spot. So you can see that Piaggio logo there. So we're gonna go ahead and do that, glue these grips on in the correct spot on both sides, and then we're gonna show, I guess, stuff in these tubes in. But again, you wanna do the grips now, before you install them, so you can work with them on a bench. All right, so we're at the point where we're actually ready to install the throttle tube in the handlebars. We've taken our magical blue grease and we've liberally applied it to this entire portion of the throttle tube. We've applied the same grease uh, to the uh, cast aluminum bosses or the pass-throughs that the, that the uh, throttle uh, tube is going to be passing through. You're going to notice there is no thrust washer on the throttle side. So there's that kind of stopper washer that's built into the actual tube itself like we talked about in the earlier clip. That serves as the thrust or stop washer for the actual throttle tube. The P-Series bikes are actually equipped with a throttle return spring. Um, so you need to make sure the throttle return spring goes on you know, the right-hand side of the actual uh, throttle stop. So we'll go ahead and pass this thing through. We're not going to worry about installing the spring yet, but we definitely need to make sure that we at least have it in here um, before we install the uh, throttle pulley. So again, we just have that loosely in place. I'll take the actual plastic throttle pulley. I always take the time to actually pack a little grease in that channel. And you'll notice there's actually a stop there that basically limits you know, the amount of throw you actually have in the throttle. And that stop actually corresponds to this cast aluminum knuckle on the handlebars there and in there. So I'll go ahead and put this on the cable. Just kind of let the cable just kind of dangle like that. It's not going to go anywhere. And then when you take the handlebars apart, you would have noticed there's a flat washer and a wave washer. The wave washer, which you see in my left greasy hand here goes against the actual plastic pulley and the flat washer goes against the actual cast aluminum handlebar. So you want to take those two, kind of loosely put those in place. Now we're at the point where we can actually put the throttle pulley on and you'll notice I'm, it's binding a little bit because the cable is resistant. You can always reach down at the carburetor here and pull the inner wire and that pulls the slack out of the cable. And you want to make sure that that actual stop stays on the inside of the uh, you actually want to make sure that that stop stays on this side of the actual uh, handlebars. Now, once we're at this point, you're going to want to grab this E-clip looking thing. And the throttle tube is actually drilled um, and keyed so it'll really only go together one correct way. But basically, the hole in the throttle tube and the hole in the actual pulley will line up. You'll push this through, clip it in place, and that's it. And one thing you do want to note is you want to make sure that you've got the notches or the relief cuts that are you know, kind of on opposite ends of each other in the throttle tube are on the correct side. So the actual front brake cable, this one here. So this actual front brake cable can basically pass through the inside notch, out the outside notch, and actually seat in the handlebar. So this is the correct way. So once that hole's lined up, we'll put the pin in and, and that's it. A lot of times too, you have to kind of push in, kind of push in with the tube, 
compress those wave washers, jiggle stuff around. You gotta be able to look right down over it. Okay, so hopping over to the shifter side, you'll notice the actual shift tube has already been installed. You install that the same way you did the throttle. Uh, there's one thing to note, there's an extra flat washer, a thrust washer, and it's really important that that thrust washer go between the actual shift tube and the cast aluminum handlebar. I don't know if you can really see it in there, but it makes it so that thing just rocks bats effortlessly as Robot was demonstrating there. So that's all hooked up. We've got our cables in place. Again, we don't really care which is the upshift and downshift yet because we can still adjust at the motor. Uh, Robot's got the switch wiring, uh, so he'll take it from there. Yeah, I got the fish wire through. Again, passing from this side, kind of passes back behind here and go, comes out on the right, right side. And again, it's uh, between the shift cable and the um, clutch cable there. So pull that, and this one's so thin that it doesn't really need. This one's significantly anything. easier to pull through. So you see I got the, just the wires tied to the little terminals. Oh boy. I just use my teeth to, to break these off here. Watch this. That's what, that's what, the, that's what the fans want to see, robot. <laughs> All right, so these are your two switch connections right here. And we're actually going to tie them to the junction box wiring. Uh, all the same, pretty much just line up the colors nice and easy. You got blue to blue. It's your turn signal. You got your other turn signal, your brown to brown. What's that one? This is going to be a good scene. What about talking about the colors of the wires? There's one that's bigger, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, but these uh, replacement harnesses don't have it. So I've actually, on some of these, I've crimped you know, the 316 terminals on it. Got it. But I think it's the um, white normally. Wasn't the white, the white one bigger? or something is normally bigger. So the robot's gonna go ahead and finish uh, clicking the color, correct color to the correct color, and then you kind of neatly want to tuck them back in this horn cover, and then you slam this shut, and it kind of clicks closed. If you have one of these, don't throw it away. Can't get these anymore, actually. We're down to our last, like, 10 or so, and they're actually, like, refurbished ones, so they're kind of ugly looking, but... I think that junction box number 149082, maybe? 149082, 149082. Back, back in the day, I used to throw those things away just for the fun of it. I know, I do. Well, that was fun. Throwing those things away was a blast. God, what were we thinking? Well, Robot's kind of neatly stuffing those things in there. He's getting pretty excited. He's dealing with wires. You see, He's they're all in the little grooves. Oh, look at that. Is that nice? And there's always that extra bonus slot, and you can kind of just isolate the wires. I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason for the bonus slot, but it's in there. And oh, look how neat that is. Look at that. That was very nice. And then Steve can shut the door. To <laughs> shut the box, dude, like the flight ele flying elephant style. Yeah. Clicks in place on the right, clicks in place on the left. Get your hand out of the way. Watch this. <sighs> now, now it's snapped. Oh, we forgot these two wires. Damn. Oh, wait. That's for the horn. Madar. I went ahead and put the headset top all back together. It's all the original parts. Uh, the speedometer has all been rebuilt, uh, basically with a new rim and a new speedometer glass. It's like a flat glass in place of the, the dome one. Uh, you see the scooter has uh, over 36,000 miles on it. Uh, definitely nice to rebuild this because this thing was quite beat up from people having keys. You know, jiggling all over the speedometer. So obviously, best thing to do is just only have the ignition key in there. Uh, also made sure all the lights worked in there. It's kind of a bummer when you put this all back together and then you find out half or all the lights are burned out. Uh, there's your neutral light. You got some ground connections right there. Reused the uh, ignition switch. I put some dielectric grease on the uh, electrical terminals. Uh, this is actually your, um, your light for the speedometer and I put like a different style bulb in there. There's an LED replacement bulb. Ooh, trick. Um, I think the part number is uh, 12E3W LED or something like that. That's a replacement LED version. Works good on these. You can actually even put one in a neutral. The bulb was fine. Kind of gives the uh, speedometer kind of a, a, a cool white look versus the kind of glowing candle look that it normally has. But that's all pretty much ready to go. The other thing to talk about is this bracket for the speedometer here. It actually, you see these little plastic doohickeys on there. I don't know if you can really get those parts anymore, but actually the wiring actually feeds underneath that. So when we have it all finished, 
the wiring will actually go underneath. So you could actually flip the speedometer cover over and it's nice and neat versus just having this stuff all like shoved in there like most people do. Most of the time I take these apart, they're a big mess under there. And one thing while Robot was talking about the rebuilt speedometer, hold that thing back up there, so Robot. So he said he rebuilt it, but you see it almost looks virtually brand new. He's gone so far as to repaint the needle black or the needle, the tip of it red. Uh, but we actually sell these parts on the Scooter West website as far as the actual uh, glass or plastic lens, as well as like the uh, metal bezel. The metal bezel is available in black or chrome. The part number, the prefix for part number for all the Speedo parts and the P-Series parts is uh, 185391, I believe. We also can rebuild the Speedo for you. If you send it to us, we've got a special jig that was made by our dear friend Ant. He's moved on to England, but he's got a, he made a nice jig that that thing fits in so we can actually crimp over that bezel all clean. All right, I think one of the more, I don't know if it's technical, but one of the things that definitely comes with expertise is actually threading cables through the correct way. I'm gonna show you first of all the front brake. On the front brake, you'll notice there's this thing we kind of commonly call the top hat. Uh, the P-Series, the front brake cable is the only cable that uses the top hat. And this is essentially the seat. So the housing will seat in the back of that and then that will fit in the handlebars and that basically keeps the housing secure. The easiest way to do this is to kind of hold the actual top hat. You can actually, you know, be totally honest, you can actually keep the top hat back in here. You want to take the cable and pass it through and the cable is basically going to pass through the two passageways on the front brake cable or on the actual throttle tube. And now at this point, you actually want to make sure you put that top hat on. Um, you always want to be nice and liberal with the grease. Again, this grease is like just absolutely outstanding for threading the cables through. So what I'll kind of do is with my right hand, kind of massage and lube the grease onto the cable. Will you play the sensual music right now? All right, well, we had a little technical difficulty with the audio, so I'm gonna go ahead and dub over some of this. Uh, Steve's pretty much just pushing the cable through, you know, the cable in or through the housing. You know, getting, out, I would say, maybe half the cable through. And you can see the cable in, kind of hanging out where the lever's gonna go eventually. And now that's popped through the bottom, he's gonna pull it. You know, the, the actual cable inners are generally, you know, a lot longer for the front because the housing's so short for the front brake cable. And it's, the cable's universal between the um, clutch and the front brake on these scooters here. We're pretty much all, all vintage Vespas. All right, so we're getting ready to put the lever on. Uh, one key thing that's missed on many restorations I've seen is there's actually three different washers that are used to shim the lever. Uh, Steve's gonna go ahead and get those three washers out and show you what they are. There's the step bolt. Uh, those step bolts come in both a Phillips head and a flat head, kind of depending on your PX or P200E would use the Phillips. And you can see the three different washers he has. Uh, the one that his hand's closest to is the uh, small one that only goes on the threaded section. And then the two larger washers, there's a, a wave spring washer that's got, got a larger diameter inside of the washer hole or whatever you want to call it. And then there's also a flat one. And the spring one actually goes on the top, then you have the flat one against the lever. And underneath the lever is where the smaller one and Steve's going to go ahead and use some grease, you know, kind of grease the lever, both the pivot and also the spot where the, the cable barrel drops in. And he'll, he'll set the washers in place, kind of just roughly set them in place. So he's got the flat washer, that's got the larger diameter hole. Then he'll set the wave washer, that's got the larger diameter hole. And the last one is going to be the smaller, sm smaller diameter hole washer that's on the bottom. And this applies for both the clutch and the front brake. All right, he's gonna go ahead and hook the cable barrel in. One thing is you don't want the cable barrel to be twisted you know, in the lever. I've seen countless times where somebody's installed it and the, the cable barrel's like 90 degrees of where it should be. And you may need to quit twist the cable or pull it back out to kind of straighten the the, um, the barrel out and kind of keep an eye on those three washers make sure they don't pop out of place um, they just need to be roughly lined up with the hole that the pivot screw is going to go through 
and Steve's going to go ahead and use a large center punch and drop it right down the hole and that will actually line up all three of those washers with the um, with the little threaded boss that's on the bottom of the, the handlebar casting. And once you do that, it makes it much easier to thread the, the step screw through the pivot, pivot screw, pivot bolt, whatever you want to call it. So with the Phillips screwdriver, go ahead and get that started. Generally, I like to, to screw those until they stop and then back it off, I would say, eighth or a quarter turn. Sometimes the threads are damaged in the, the actual aluminum headset casting. No big deal because the nylock uh, nut will hold it in place. And he's going to go ahead and use a nut driver and, and thread the, the 5mm nylock nut onto that pivot pole. And again, you don't want to crank on it too much. You want it just where the lever has a little bit of slop, you know, a little free play up and down. You don't want it to uh, be so tight that that lever binds. You know, the whole idea is just that keeps the lever from vibrating between the washers, the nylock nut that kind of pinches the whole the whole thing down. So. All right, Steve's going to go ahead and thread the inner cable through the actual cable adjuster. That's um, you know pretty much right right behind where the shock mounts. Go ahead and feed the cable through, and he's feeding it through the cable clamp that's been installed. You know, there's a brand new cable clamp kit on the actual brake pivot pin and that the, the, the screws got a hole in there to thread the cable through. Steve's got the cable threaded through. Um, he's going to go ahead and use the third hand tool to, um, to take some of the slack out of the cable here. And generally I like to adjust these where the lever, you know, with a fresh set of brake shoes in the front hub lever should have about a quarter to a half inch, you know, six millimeters to 12 millimeters of um, free play in it. You know, if it's too tight, of course, the, the brakes could bind up. You know, and Steve's actually rotating the tire to kind of get a feel for where the free play is. You can see he's holding it in place. Kind of when you find the right spot, go ahead and, and torque that with the uh, lock nut down, 11 millimeter nut. And you don't want to crank too tight on it because it does have that hollow screw. You know, if you over tighten it, it will actually break the um, break the screw. And obviously, check the operation from the top. Yeah, that's too much. I can tell you that right now. So he's got to go ahead and tighten that up a little bit more. Again, about a quarter inch to half inch on the lever play. You know, with a fresh set of brake brake shoes. Keep in mind, you know, with new shoes, they tend to take a little bit of the break in. All right, now the front's all finished up, we're going to talk about hooking up the selector box. Uh, really important to hook up the selector box with it not mounted to the motor. That's a common mistake. I see a lot of people try to install the cables with the selector box still bolted to the engine. It's definitely possible, but it's much easier to do it when it's out. Um, right now the selector box is in neutral. It's of those five detents. It's the kind of uh, shallow detent. And the inner cable that's closest to the motor is the cable that actually pulls it towards first gear. The cable on the outside is the pulls it towards um, second and third. And I'm verifying that. Originally, the uh, cable housings were uh, two different colors to differentiate the push and the pull cable based on if you're going down downshifting or upshifting. But you can verify that just by reaching up to the shift shift tube, you know, pull it towards second, third, and then that's going to be the cable you're going to route on the outside. So now i got them all in the right, right spots there. I'm uh, going to roughly set it to neutral and just pull a little bit of the slack out of the cables and go ahead and install one of the cable clamps. And right now I don't have the headset top on, but it makes the job much easier if you have the headset top because the headset top has a little, um, a little dimple that indicates neutral. And starting out with a fresh set of uh, cable clamps. I'm going to go ahead and kind of tuck the cable into the, um, the groove and slide the cable clamp into place. 
going to have an eight millimeter wrench to hold the cable clamp in place and and a seven millimeter uh, socket or or whatever nut driver to actually tighten the um, the clamp itself. So again, I kind of have a rough the the selector roughly in neutral. I'll pull a little bit of slack out. And I'm actually making minor adjustments to the um, the shift wheel. You know, it was a little bit tight, so the cable clamp wouldn't fit in there. All right, go ahead and tuck that in there. You know, into the groove, put the eight millimeter wrench on there, and go ahead and lightly torque the cable clamp itself. And I'm actually doing the the upshift cable. So go ahead and you could verify that it's it's still neutral. You know, kind of give it a tug. You can see I pulled a little bit more slack out. And repeat with the um, downshift cable. And it's a little tight. You need to wiggle it into the slot. Make minor modifications to it. You kind of find that with a lot of vintage parts, even even new parts. You know they. Sometimes the tolerance is a little off on some of these new parts, and you got to make minor modifications to get things to fit nice. All right, so now both cables are tightened up. You can actually uh, you can see the little cutouts in the wheel that actually holds the cable in, in place. You want to go ahead and cut those cables once you know that it's all been set up correctly. And oftentimes I'll, I'll use. Uh, soldering flux and, and solder and a soldering iron or a small torch to actually tin the ends of the cables because I'm going to cut them much shorter. You don't want those two whiskers. Um, verifying that it functions right. Looks like it has a little bit too much free play in there. Um, you can make minor adjustments with the two adjusters. You know, Again, get it right to the neutral detent and verify that the neutral pretty much perfectly lines up with the headset top. And keep in mind, you don't want to have the shift cables too tight. You want to have, I would say, about a, you know, eighth to a quarter inch of free play, you know, rotational free play in the actual shift tube itself. You know, if it's too tight, you tend to uh, miss shift, is what I've noticed, or the the cables will bind, which causes difficult shifting. And go ahead and tighten the lock nuts on the two cable adjusters. Again, if you need to uh, take quite a bit of slack out with those cable adjusters, it's probably best to, um, to start over, loosen the cable clamps, and, and go ahead and pull more slack out of the, the, the cables and retighten those cable clamps there. Uh, to get this on, we're going to go ahead and lift the tire. You'll be able to pull that selector spindle out, you know, you know get it to you know, third or fourth. Actually, that's um, excuse me, first or second. So you pretty much pull out. You get the um, the paw um, aligned with the um, the slot on that that selector spindle. You have the gasket in place, and go ahead and carefully, you know, pull that the selector box in place. They say use the shift tube, you know, with the two cables out. You know, with the two nuts out of place, you could actually pull the selector right onto the um, the engine there. And when you're all finished up, you want to grease everything. You know, go ahead and liberally grease the whole selector assembly. Uh, generally, I like to put a good amount of grease in the actual selector cover once you get the motor buttoned up. You know, it's nice to have the extra grease if you ever need to change out your clutch cable. Uh, Steve's going to go ahead and demonstrate uh, installation of the speedometer cable. Uh, he's pulled the inner out, and that's very important because you need the inner to actually thread the outer through the steering column tube itself. Right now there's no grease on that cable, it's a brand new cable. And the speedometer cable is going to feed the end that does not have the little brass, you know, stop on it up the up the, the fork tube, you know, there's an upper hole that's for 
for the um, speedometer cable to pass through. And you can kind of see it up in there. It's the larger of the two holes. Of course, the uh, front brake cable comes out of the smaller hole and that's already been installed. So now the inner cable's popping through the top. Generally, I like to grease the end of the, um, the housing just a little bit so it'll slide through easier. And go ahead and fish the, the speedometer cable housing over the inner cable from, from the top to the bottom. He's feeding that down and once you get to a stop you'll need to kind of reach reach for a cable and use the inner cable to help guide the housing through that that um, the hole that's in the fork or steering column itself and it pulls right out and that's the trick to replacing a speed armor cable on a Vespa. You're never going to be able to fish it through from the top down. You have to use an inner cable or or some some sort of stiff wire to, to help fish the housing through. So Steve's going to go ahead and clean the, um, the inner cable. Uh, you want to put a light layer of grease over the whole length. Generally, I don't put too much grease up, up towards the top because it has a tendency to kind of work its way up into the speedometer assembly. Steve's feeding that inner cable down. And oftentimes the inner will get uh, hung up right where the outer housing you know, makes the bend to go through the fork. And when you hit to that point, you can actually go down and reach, pull the, um, the cable housing down just a little bit, and it will allow the cable to pass you know, through easily. So he'll be able to get the remainder of the inner cable through the housing. There it is.